So we're in Revelation chapter 14 and we're in verse 4. Uh, it says, uh, <coughs> well, that's before we go on to these or they, uh, we're talking about the 144,000 that uh, a lot of churches want to claim that 144,000. And it's not just the Jehovah's Witnesses, although they're the ones that are most notable for it. But there's other, uh, you may or may not know it, but the Catholics want to chain, claim that 144,000. And so, uh, so it's talking about the 144,000. It says, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whethersoever uh, he goeth. These are... These were redeemed from among man, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So, this 144,000 are all virgin males, not a female in the group. So, that brings up a lot of speculation by a lot of people. Uh, they look at this thing and they, it's a special group. We, we talked about them being a special group last week. I mean, they sing the Song of Moses, and the Bible says no other being, heavenly or earthly, can learn that song. So they're set apart. They have something special going on. So the Catholics, um, they're not Catholic priests. That's what the Catholic Church wants you to believe, that because it says that they weren't defiled with women and uh, that they're virgins, that obviously they have to be uh, Catholic priests. But we know they're not Catholic priests because they're Jews. The Bible's real specific. They're Jews. They're not Catholics. And uh, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, the people who the Jehovah's Witness have identified of the 144,000, most are not virgins. <laughs> and uh, they're not the bride of Christ, as some folks would like to tell you. They're not the bride of Christ. Uh, no Christian in anywhere in the Bible is ever referred to as a virgin. Now, the Bible talks about virgins, and we've looked at some of those references to virgins, but the the child of God, the, the new, new age, new, not new age, the New Testament born-again Christian is never referred to in the Bible as a virgin. Um, the bride of Christ is made up of Christians, and as a group they're referred to as a chaste virgin. One, singular, no S, virgin. Um, it's singular, and, and here in our text it refers to virgins, plural. And I'm going to make a big deal about having a plural or a singular <laughs> because it is significant. Uh, little things make a huge difference in the Bible. Yes. You, you gotta pay attention to the small details. If you're wanting to learn the Bible and understand the Bible, you gotta pay attention to the small things because uh, after all, if God's gonna come and speak to you in a still small voice, you know, bring the tornado, bring the fire, bring the wind, bring the thunderstorms and the crackling thunder, and God wasn't in any of them, but when the still, small voice came, there was God. And so you got to pay attention to the small things in life. Little things make a huge difference. Uh, the difference between, in, in just that S, between virgin and virgins, it's the difference between being a church-age Christian and being a tribulation saint. Just that S. And so you got to pay attention to things. Uh, it's the difference of being saved by grace or being saved by works and grace. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm not sure, you know, nobody's ever come to argue the point with me, but I'm not sure that everybody fully understands that not every dispensation is saved the same way. Uh, the tribulation saint was, isn't saved by, faith, by grace through faith. They have to have faith. That's part of their salvation, but they also have to do works. They have to endure to the end. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So the difference between that S and not having that S is false doctrine. To not understand what that little S means on virgins, it makes the difference between correct doctrine and false doctrine. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to be in Matthew 25 a little bit, so when you get there you may want to just kind of bookmark it because we're going to be, we're going to be going back and forth a little bit to it. Uh, Matthew 25 and verse 1. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Ten virgins, plural. And it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. 
And I made it a big point here to talk about the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven because most preachers just interlace the two like they're the same thing. But the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things. Everybody get that? And how do we know they're two different things? Because the Bible tells us, amen. Because you, what do you say? They're spelled differently. They are spelled differently. Heaven's not spelled G-O-D. <laughs> and God's not spelled H-E-A-B-E-N. Amen? And uh, God is not heaven and heaven is not God. And go ahead, Monty, you can say it. Things that are different are not the same. That's a deep theological uh, premise that you have to get a hold of. I mean, things that are different are not the same. And so when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, what are we talking about? Physical. It's physical. It is the physical, literal kingdom that Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom on earth. That's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, it's spiritual. The minute you got saved, you entered the kingdom of God. And uh, you, you didn't enter the kingdom of heaven yet. You entered the kingdom of God. And so Matthew is a tribulation book to the Jews... It's a gospel of, to the Jews about the tribulation. And so you see the kingdom of heaven referenced again and again and again. And as a matter of fact, in your entire, entire Bible, the book of Matthew is the only book that makes any reference to the kingdom of heaven. Every place else, is, when it's talking about salvation, it says the kingdom of God. Yeah. The, well, the Jews and a lot of Gentiles are going to go through the tribulation as well. But, but the, you know, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not physical. It's not something that you can put your hand on and touch. It's something that's inside you. And so, and, and you see contemporary uh, musicians get this thing screwed up all the time. They'll talk about, let the kingdom of heaven start with me. Well, the kingdom of heaven is not going to start with you. The kingdom of heaven is going to start with the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God can start in you. Uh, the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And a lot of uh, uh, folks that want to teach it, you can lose your salvation, say, see, you've got to work out your salvation. It doesn't just come all at once. You gotta... But that's not what it's saying. You know, I already have a body, right? But I can go work out my body to get some muscles on it, to get rid of stuff that some folks may not think is too appealing, right? I can go work out my body and make some changes in the way that I look. Well, when you're working out your salvation, that's what you're doing. You're exercising your faith and you're exercising the things that, you know, we just had a series on, a mini series, I guess, two, two Sundays, we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. When you're working out your salvation, you're developing those fruits of the Spirit. And we're supposed to develop those fruits. I mean, the, the Bible says that a, a good tree is supposed to have good fruit. And there's preachers that say that that fruit is winning souls to Christ. And if you don't win somebody to Christ, then you're not a Christian. Well, that's nonsense. Um, what it's saying is that you got to, if there's no fruits manifested in your life, if you don't have any joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, if you don't have any of those fruits, boy, you need to probably do some soul searching to see if you meant business on the day that you profess to be saved. Well, that's Well, the, that, that's absolutely true, but you can't just lean on that because Satan is a great imitator and he's a great deceiver. So he might deceive you, making, he, making you sure. think that he's giving you peace and joy. But usually the devil's peace and joy comes with a price tag at the end of it and it winds up not being peace and joy at all. But for a, a, look at some of these rock stars that died so young. Yes. Here they thought they had the world by the tail. But the world turned around and bit them. Amen? I mean, you think, uh, uh, what was that plane crash? It took down, like, Ford, Ricky Valens, uh, Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper. And there's another one on there, too, but I don't know. But one plane crash. Ricky Valens wasn't even in his 20s yet. I think he was, like, 16 or 17. And... Rising to this, a rising star, amen. The devil came to them, those folks, and said, 
I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you happiness and peace and all that stuff. But the world turned around and bit them in the butt. And I can't say that from the pulpit. Uh, bit them in the... Posterior. Posterior. There you go. <laughs> and uh, listen, folks, I try, but I'm just a country boy. I can't help it. So notice that in uh, Matthew 25, verse 1, it's talking about virgins, plural. It doesn't say that then shall the body of Christ, the church, be likened unto virgin single males. It doesn't say that. But it's talking about virgins. And we know that this is in the tribulation. And it's right at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says, Ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Well, the Lord doesn't come back till the end of the tribulation. So we've already been gone. The tribulation saints are there, and it's referring to them as virgins, plural. Uh, look at verse 6 in Matthew. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. It's the Lord come. That's the second advent. He's coming back to the world. And these virgins are instructed to go out, and, and not all of them make it. Some of those virgins don't have any oil for their lamp and they run to get oil and by the time they get back the door's been shut and they're not invited in. Because in the tribulation you have to endure to the end. And they weren't enduring to the end. They got caught unawares. You know, Jesus kept saying stuff like, don't be taken unaware. Don't be taken by surprise. The day of the Lord is as a thief in the night. And remember, we went through that great big thing, and I don't know who was here and who wasn't here because it's summertime and we miss a lot of folks, but we, we went about this great big thing showing how we are in the nighttime right now spiritually. We're in night. And the Lord's going to come back. And then it's going to be the dawning of the day when he comes back. So <clears throat> these virgins are going to meet him, not marry him. We're the bride of Christ. The marriage has already taken place. Now the bridegroom's coming out and the virgins are going to go meet him, not marry him. Got to pay attention to the subtle differences in things. And uh, the 144,000 virgins mentioned in Revelation 14 are the same type of virgins mentioned in Matthew 25. They are tribulation saints. They are virgins who endure to the end. At the end of the tribulation, they're caught up to meet the bridegroom as he comes. They are not members of the one true body of Christ, which is caught out to meet Christ when he comes for the church. That's where we take them place. And so uh, when Christ comes for the church, he's coming for a chaste virgin, singular. We all make up the body of Christ. One bride, not... 144,000 brides for Christ. One bride. Amen? Amen? Is everybody with me so far? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, 2 Corinthians comes right after 1 Corinthians. That's good. That ought to help you. Okay, 2 Corinthians what? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. My pages are sticking together. I had it figured out, but then that fan hit them and knocked it out of my hand. Let's look at verse 13, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13. It says, uh, no, excuse me, verse 1, 13 ain't what I want. I looked down there and I said, man, that doesn't fit anything I'm trying to say. Verse 1, it says, would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused to you one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin, singular, to Christ. That's talking to the body of Christ. And, uh, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguile thee through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That devil's subtle. He can come with a shiny new car looking all good, you know, and, and you may think, man, that's just going to, that's a cast me out. It's going to make my day. It's going to make me happy and joyful. It's going to give me peace. And as soon as you get in love with that car, you're going to head out on the highway and it's going to get smacked and crashed and crumpled up. And then the devil's pleasures are for but for a season. Amen. So uh, these are virgins, plural, who endure to the end. And I said that before. The bride of Christ has already been gone for seven years. We're right at the end of 
In Revelation chapter 14, we are right at the end of the tribulation. So the bride of Christ, maybe not quite seven years, maybe six years and six months or six years and nine months. The Bible doesn't give us specifics, but we know we're at the, right at the end of the tribulation. And these virgins keep the Mosaic law and they sing the Song of Moses. Anybody know the Song of Moses? Anybody want to sing uh, the Song of Moses for me real quick? We can't learn it. That's my point. So they sing the song of Moses. They go to meet the bridegroom as he returns to the earth at the second advent. Notice the wording. You know, some of these things you look at when you're reading them and, and they don't make sense. But when you start comparing scripture with scripture, you go, oh my gosh. That lines up perfectly. Look at Psalm 45. You can't, you can't know God without comparing Scripture with Scripture. I don't care how good an orator or a preacher is, if he doesn't compare Scripture with Scripture, he's going to lead you astray. The only way you can know truth is by comparing Scripture with Scripture. So look at Psalm uh, 45, verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is, wrought, uh, is of wrought gold. Verse 14, she shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework, the virgins. Now that king's daughter, that's us. That's the bride of Christ. But she's going to be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. And then look at the next phrase. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. They're not the bride of Christ. They're tribulation saints. They come after us. And... Uh, with gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. They're going into the kingdom of heaven. The actual physical kingdom that God's going to come and establish on earth. Amen. So the virgins are companions that follow the king's daughter. They are companions of the chaste virgin. They're, uh, the chaste virgin is the bride of Christ. And We've already gone. We've already got married. We're coming back. And the, bride, the bridegroom's coming and these virgins are going to go. The, the thing of virgins, you know, when we humans talk about virgins, we think of uh, sexual purity. But the virgins in the scripture is just referring to purity in soul and spirit. And so, but the 144,000, they are literal virgins. They have not been defiled by women. You say, preacher, I don't think that you should say that when a man and a woman have a relationship that he's defiled by a woman. It's the Bible that said it, not me. They're not defiled by women. So the, the, it's not the Jehovah's Witnesses who try to lay claim on the 144,000, as does the Catholic Church. Uh, there's a teaching out there that says the 144,000 virgins are Roman Catholic priests. It's questionable whether a Roman Catholic priest or is a virgin or not. I mean, there's never been a church with more sexual scandals than the Roman Catholic Church, and and uh, and this isn't a recent phenomenon. You know, when they found the catacombs and all those bodies down in the catacombs, did you know they found a whole bunch of of baby skeletons of nuns that had babies by priests because they they couldn't be vocal about it because we're virgins. We are we're we believe in chastity and we don't but they're human beings and they they weren't virgins and and so if you think well pastor that's just a recent phenomenon no it's not no it's not that's been going on since the catholic church first form and formed and so it's questionable to me whether i don't look at a catholic priest and automatic assume, automatically assume that that person's a virgin matter of fact in this point in my life I have to defend my, my attitude against them to not think that they're a child molester because it's been so prevalent in their church. The Seventh-day Adventists also like, like to lay claim to it, but they can't do to the biblical description of these 144,000. Uh, let's look to the biblical perspective. The men have identified by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they've already identified the 144,000. They... They could literally print a book with 144,000 in it. Um, so, well, no, the 144,000 that they claim are in it. The, they can print a book. 
put it in there. And I, I, uh, I get very sarcastic with Jehovah's Witnesses. I say, so what, what you're saying is you guys could have a copy of the Book of Lamb before anybody else ever sees it. Even though in Revelation it says nobody could open the book until the Lamb came out. But you guys could print it if you wanted to. And so the Jehovah's Witness try to lay claim on this, but the problem is, is and, and they can give you a list of the names of those that are identified. Most of them are married. They're not virgins. They're married. And, and, and uh, if they're married, they're not chaste virgins. And for those who are not married, a large percentage of them would have to admit that they were not virgins either. <laughs> and beyond that, they didn't keep the Old Testament law because that was one of the premises too. They keep the Mosaic law. Jehovah's Witnesses don't keep that. They keep a couple of them. They say they keep a couple of them. You know, it's there's some laws in the Old Testament the Mosaic Law that are pretty easy to keep. I've never killed anybody. I mean, who in here has murdered somebody? Good thing I didn't see hands go up. I never thought about that. <laughs> but you know what? That's a pretty easy one to keep, isn't it? Thou shalt place no God above the Lord thy God. That one's a little bit tougher. Because you may have a God that it, you don't even think of as a God, but, but you worship it. You give it all your time and all your effort. That's making something a God. That's a little bit tougher. Um, may be single, but one would, like I said, one would question the true state of their virginity. They also fail to keep the Old Testament law. And one could easily prove that they don't keep the New Testament provision either because one of the things is, is they keep the Old Testament law and they have faith in Christ. So they got to be both the Old Testament and the New Testament. That makes it kind of tough. Because um, the, the New Testament says the law doesn't really pertain to us anymore. You say, what? That's what New Testament, you have liberty in Christ. But Paul said, should my liberty make me sin? God forbid you don't go breaking the law. Although you're not under the law. Amen? Does that make yeah. sense? So <clears throat> they don't believe in salvation by grace through faith. The Catholics don't. They don't and neither do the Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe in salvation uh, by grace through faith. They don't believe that. And that's New Testament sal salvation. The Seventh-day Adventists, they don't keep the uh, Old Testament law. Listen, none of those who claim ownership to the 144,000 know the Song of Moses. You're having a problem with the Jehovah's Witness? Ask them to sing you the Song of Moses. They don't know it. The 144,000 do. Most importantly, these 144,000 don't even show up into the scene until after the church is raptured out. So they can't be... I, I guess they could be alive today and miss the rapture if the rapture takes place, you know, but the thought of somebody that's already been dead and gone can't be one of the 144. It's physically impossible because they're alive and walking the face of the earth in Revelation chapter 7, and now they're in heaven in Revelation chapter 14. They got raptured. Amen? So, uh... The church is gone, and the, these tribulation, these are tribulation Jewish virgins who take an exact, who are taken an exact proportion, twelve thousand per each tribe. And if you take twelve thousand times twelve, you get one hundred and forty-four thousand. And it's not just one hundred and forty-four thousand Jews, twelve thousand from each specific tribe. That blows everybody out of the water. So if a church tells you that they got the 144,000, say, okay, I want you to identify to me the 12,000 from each tribe. Well, they can't do that. I don't think the Jew today can even identify what tribe they're from. That, that ship has sailed. I don't think they can do it. By applying these 144,000 to those who get saved in the church age is saying there will not be a single solitary woman saved. If you're saying that only the 144,000 go to heaven and they're all chaste male virgins. <laughs> and that's what they do for Jehovah's Witness, right? Yep. So there's not a single woman going to go to heaven. Sorry, girls. You may as well go home. <laughs> you're already gone. <laughs> it's crazy. Women are gonna, there's probably going to be more women in heaven than men. Amen. Women are softer hearted than men. And they're, they're, they're what? 
and they are smarter than I think they are. Now there ain't a woman smarter than me, but <laughs> on average, probably. You know, I'm just joking. I used to always joke around when I was a young man saying there wasn't a woman on earth that could beat me up, but I've run into some pretty tough women. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 5. It says, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were, are without fault before the throne of God. So here we go again. We're looking at a biblical doctrine that seems to have been lost in time. It isn't, but it seems to have been. Notice I said it seems to be lost. It isn't lost in time. There's still hundreds, if not thousands, of churches that, that are preaching dispensational truth. But the majority of churches aren't. And so it appears that this doctrine has been lost in time, uh, but it's not. Uh, what we're looking at in Revelation chapter 14 is a picture that happens right before the second advent of the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. But right before the Lord comes back, uh, and these are tribulation saints who, are, who endured to the end, as it says in Matthew 24, verse 13. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to tell you what it says. It says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is only talking about, you know, there's so many preachers that want to take that statement and say that applies to you. You have to endure to the end. If you don't endure to the end, you're not going to be saved. And so, if, and I've had somebody tell me that when I was a young Christian. But I don't just take stuff. I said, so what do you got to do to endure to the end? <laughs> well, you got to stay faithful. You got to continue to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, well, that's not too tough to just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know what? There's some guys that could be Christians that have denounced their faith. And the Bible has something to say about it. The Bible says that if we deny him, he will deny us. That doesn't mean that you lose your salvation. It means you're going to lose rewards because it goes on to say that he will stay faithful because he cannot deny himself. When you got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, came to live inside of you, and God can't deny that. So Donna gets a wild hair and says, I'm leaving this whole Christian thing. I'm going with my kids and the Jehovah's Witness. A charismatic person says she lost her salvation. But God said, I can't deny myself. He's living inside of you, and I cannot deny myself. So she'll get to heaven, but she won't have a whole lot of rewards. I don't know about you, but I want rewards in heaven. You want rewards in heaven? There's nothing wrong with wanting them. The Bible says, lay up your treasures in heaven. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with laying up your treasures in heaven. That's what we're supposed to do. So these endure to the end. These folks endure to the end. By overcoming the devil, by not taking the mark of the beast. But that's not all. Uh, they also, uh, the thing that gave them the power to not take the mark of the beast is by observing and obeying the Mosaic law. <laughs> that's enduring to the end. These clowns that tell you you've got to endure to the end, they're not going to mention the Mosaic law. They're not going to mention the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast doesn't apply to us right now, does it? Nope. Will. Has somebody come to you in the last month and said, you need to take the mark of the beast? Doesn't apply to right now. Amen? So, uh, these kept the law, but they also had faith by believing on Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have to do both in the tribulation. In the tri tribulation, you're saved by faith and by works. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And you also got to keep the Mosaic law. Enduring to the end. They didn't take the mark of the beast and they have to believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior. But listen, they were not circumcised by the Holy Spirit of God. Their heart, their body, and their soul were not separated. That's why they have to endure to the end. I'm telling you, we live in the best age, of the best dispensation of the Bible. Because when we get saved, we get that spiritual circumcision that takes place. And it separates our soul from our body. And Paul says, when I sin now, it's no longer I that do it. Because we're not our body. But it's this body of flesh that's doing that sin. And so, uh, but he also goes on to say, because that's the case, should I just go ahead and sin because it's not I? Who are you? You're, you're, you are your soul. 
We are just like the Lord. We were created in God's image. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And when you talk about you, who you are, you know, Jesus Christ said, no man has seen the Father at any time. But then he also said, have I been so long with you and, you don't, and you're asking me to see the Father? Don't you realize if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? <laughs> and yet he said, no man's seen the Father at any time. That doesn't make sense, does it? Some folks would say that's a contradiction of the Bible. But it's not at all. None of you have seen me at any time. You see my body. None of you have seen my soul. And nobody has seen God at any time. They've seen his body, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they haven't seen his soul. And they haven't seen his spirit. You can feel his spirit, but you can't see his spirit. Amen? When somebody says, I saw the Holy Spirit of God, there's one account in the Bible where they saw the Holy Spirit of God descending on Jesus like a dove. But that was a manifestation to point to who Jesus was. It was an unusual circumstance. So, all this means that their salvation is obtained by a combination of grace and works. These are caught up at the end of the tribulation to meet the bridegroom. And some of these tribulation saints are shown to have lost their salvation in Matthew 25. Because if you go on and read about those, and I talked about it, but we didn't read it. But if you were to go down and read that, those ten virgins, five of them had oil in their lamps and five of them didn't. And they asked the five that had oil, give oil in our lamps so that we can, and then they said, uh-uh. Not giving you our oil because we'll run out of oil too. You go down to the store and buy some oil. So they all took off to go to the store to buy some oil. When they came back, the door was already shut. And they pounded on the door. Hey, we want to get in. We're virgins too. But they didn't endure to the end. And they aren't going to be let in. Some of these faiths, the Jehovah's Witnesses particularly, they, they, they see God as an all-loving God. And if he's an all-loving God, he couldn't possibly send somebody to hell. Now, humanly speaking, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But you know what? That all-loving God brought a flood that killed every man, woman, and child on this earth except eight. And you know, some of those women running for higher ground had a little baby in their arms. And when survival kicked in, they dropped that baby so that the baby would drown. And they kept running for higher ground, but they couldn't get to higher ground because the flood came. That was an all-loving God that did that. You say, man, preacher, that's hard to understand. You don't have to understand everything about God. But you know what I do know? It's an all-loving God that did it. He loved me enough to save my soul. Amen. And he's going to love sending some folks to hell. You say, what? There, there's folks that say Christ is going to cry when he's throwing folks into hell. Look at Proverbs. He's laughing yes. when he's throwing folks into hell. You, you rejected my son? You know, when I uh, led Todd recently to Christ, he was struggling with this whole concept of, of salvation and God and, you know, an all-loving God. And I said, listen. Now, he had told me he was a good swimmer and he likes to swim. I said, let's say you were at a, a, at a lake and there was a guy out in the lake that was drowning. And you couldn't get to him because of where you were, but you could send your son. But you know that if your son went and saved that guy, your son was going to perish saving that guy from drowning. And so you send your son anyhow because you care and you want folks to be safe from drowning in that lake. So you send your son and your son swims all the way out to this drowning person and when he gets to him the drowning person pushes him away and says you're not the answer. <laughs> and both your son and the drowning person drown. Are you going to be mad about that drowning person who you're, you gave your son's life to save his life and they rejected your son and they both perished? God's going to be angry. And that's why, you know, I always say you can't have John 3.16 without John 3.36. John 3.36 says, if you reject Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abideth on you. Amen. When you reject him, that's just like that, your son being rejected by that drowning person. And it makes God mad. I sent my son to die for you <coughs> and you reject him? Going to make him mad. And he's going to laugh, according to Proverbs. 
Then shall you call my name, but I will not hear you. I will laugh at you. I will mock at your trouble. You mocked at me. You know, we talked about God's long suffering, amen, but there's a limit. And there comes a point where he says, you want to have a hard heart? I'll make that heart of yours hard. And you won't listen to anything because I'll harden your heart. You want a hard heart? I'll give you a hard heart. Amen? So, the gospel according to St. Matthew is the favorite gospel of the Catholics, the Liberals, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witness, and the Church of Christ. <laughs> they love that gospel. And it's not even written to them. It's a Jewish tribulation gospel. If you're going to build your doctrine in the church age out of the book of Matthew, you're probably making a mistake. They like to lean on Matthew chapter 22 and Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 because they're passages that talk about losing your salvation. And they want to convince you that you can lose your salvation. What's in it for them if you can lose your salvation? <laughs> well, now I can control you. Because the way you don't lose your salvation is by doing what I tell you to do. And the Bible calls that Nicolaitan. And God says he hates it. There's nothing I can do to take your salvation away from you. And I wouldn't want to. Think of how cruel it would be. If a church had the power to take your salvation away from you, how cruel would it be if they said, you know what, Amy, I'm upset with you. Your salvation is gone. That would just be cruel, wouldn't it? Then they jump to books such as Acts. Don't build your doctrine out of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. God is going from the Old Testament to the New Testament and he's making changes as he goes. And so things that happen in Acts don't happen anymore. Because when he goes from one dispensation to another, he does it with signs and wonders so that you know what's going on. Oh, God's changing the plan. And when he got his plan established, he takes away the signs and the wonders. Because he wants you to have faith. Because without faith it is impossible to please God. So he's identified his way through signs and wonders. But then he takes them away because I just want you to believe it. You had signs and wonders. I have the book that was written for you that tells you of those signs and wonders. Now believe it. That's faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I've never seen Jesus Christ, but he's more real to me than my wife. Amen. Never seen him, but he's real to me. Oh, amen. Time, then they like to go to Hebrews, and Hebrews is a tribulation book. And we're going to look at that a little bit in a minute. And say, I don't, I'm not sure I agree that Hebrews is a tribulation book. Well, we'll look at that in just a minute. Give me, give me a minute. You can give me a minute, can't you? <laughs> And they like to look at James, a tribulation book. Matthew, Hebrews, and James are all tribulation books to those who get saved during the tribulation. And Acts is a transitional book. These books are not written as a means to salvation during the church age, not at all. The Pauline epistles, from Romans to Philemon. All the books between Romans and Philemon are where we build our doctrine. Okay? These books are not written as a means to salvation for the church age. They contain a lot of good information. They give us a lot of good insights. They, they tell us about the character of God. They tell us how to live a moral life. But they aren't for us on salvation or, or how we live in this church age. And, and you say, I, I'm still struggling with Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. A lot of folks think he, Hebrews is a, is a uh, church age book. It's not. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. And let's, let's start with verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> wow! Wow! Isn't that a mouthful right there? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God, 
of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we w will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified to themselves the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame you know what that's saying you can't go on salvation by grace through faith let's lay aside the doctrines of Christ and that's because it's a tribulation book and let's go on to a bigger because in the in the tribulation if you fall you're done. There's no repentance. Because you're crucifying Christ afresh. In the church age, if you fall, you get on your knees and you say, forgive me, Lord. And you never lost your salvation even if you don't get on your knees and say, forgive me, Lord. Because that spiritual surgery took place, separating the body, soul, and spirit. And we're the only dispensation that gets that. Praise God we were born in the, yeah. in the church age. So, uh, Hebrews is a tribulation book. And if you try and build your church age doctrine out of the book of Hebrews, you're going to get all tied up in knots and you're going to start seeing contradictions all over in the Bible and you're going to say, this Christian stuff just doesn't make sense. The Bible's full of contradictions. You can make it say whatever you... I've heard them all. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And you can. But if you compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll point out those wolves in sheep clothing. The doctrines, as I told you before, the doctrines of the church age are between the books of Romans and Philemon. They're called the Pauline epistles. The Bible, I think, in three different places identifies Paul as the apostle to the Gentile. So when we set up our doctrine, we get it from a Pauline epistle. Now, it doesn't mean that we throw away the, any of the books of the Bible. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, turn there, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. I have it memorized, but I think I'm going to goof it up because I'm, I'm struggling with it right now. So I'm going to turn to it and actually read it because I don't want to goof it up. 316. And 2 Timothy, I thought it was right behind 1 Timothy, but it seems to have fallen out of my Bible. Here we go. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. However, we must rightly divide the word of truth in order to get a pure and perfect definite doctrine for each dispensation. <laughs> you can't just mix it all up. It's profitable for reproof. Now the word reproof means blame expressed to the face, censure for a fault, reprehension. Some folks don't like reproof. Most folks don't like reproof because it's right to your face. Monty, you're wrong. Amen? It's right to your face. And most folks don't like that at all. But you know what? The Bible says some, uh, in, in Proverbs 12, verse 1, it says, He that hateth reproof is brutish. Brutish. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's a friend that will look you in the eye and say, you know what, Maurice, you're wrong. <laughs> That's a friend. If they can show you in the Bible how you're wrong and how to be right, and they're taking it from a Pauline epistle, amen? You can get mad at the preacher for what he preaches, but most of the time he's preaching exactly what a Bible verse says. <laughs> this preacher, amen. What you should do is pray to God that your heart, that you learn to take reproof in a godly way. That's the best thing to do. God, will you help me to take reproof in a godly way? So, the scripture is also profitable for correction. 
But you know what? Not everybody needs correction on every point. If you look at every one of those things, you'll see how, yes, it's profitable for all those things, but not in all cases. It's profitable for instruction in, right, instruction in righteousness. Now, not all scripture reproves you because you're do, walking right in some ways. Amen? Yeah. And not all scripture corrects you because you've got some things correct. Amen? And not all scripture instructs you in righteousness because you've already learned some things and you're already doing some things right. So why do we conclude that all doctrine in scripture applies to all people? Because all the reproofs in the Bible don't apply to Donna. Monty says he's questioning that one. <laughs> you will not be corrected if you already have it right and some things you have right. You will not be reproved if you yield yourself to God and you have yielded yourself to God in many ways. Amen? The genealogy certainly don't instruct me in righteousness. You know, when you're reading through First Chronic or First Chronicles chapters one through ten, and I mean, it doesn't even talk; it just starts off. Adam, you know, nah, 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 it just starts going through genealogies. It doesn't say much of anything but a bunch of names. That doesn't instruct me in righteous righteousness. But as a whole, the scriptures fulfill all four attributes. It instructs me in doctrine. It instructs it corrects me. It reproves me, and it instructs me in righteousness. So we're going to stop. We're out of time. So I'll mark my notes right there. Monty, I'm going to sit down. Could you close us in prayer, brother?